take to others that only Christ can satisfy. If you'll take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Joshua this evening. Joshua chapter 1. The book of Joshua is the beginning of the books of history, and Joshua records the, all the consummation of, of Israel's redemption out of Egypt. And uh, they, had got, they had gone out of Egypt, but they had failed to go into the promised land. And they had been living in that wilderness situation. And a lot of times, there's Christians like that who have they've been saved, they've been gotten brought out of sin, and praise God, they've been forgiven. They've been brought out of the slave market of sin. Uh, they're at the Passover. But yet, they don't live the victorious Christian life. And they kind of wander through the wilderness. And they don't actually accomplish the things that God saved them to do. Uh, or they're not the Christians that God saved them to be. And so, uh, but then finally, after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, God brings them into the promised land. That's what God does. Uh, Moses, he, 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 in his own life, Moses was 40 years in the wilderness, in the desert, the backside of the desert, and he was 40 years old, and 40 years uh, later, he was 80 years old at the backside of the desert, and that's when he started really serving God, when he was 80 years old. So there's no time in your life where you say, uh, it's too late, I've wasted my life, God can still work in your life. And so that's what we see and learn from this this uh, particular book, that they, there's always uh, opportunity for you to have victory in your life as a, as a believer, and that's the book of Joshua here. Let's read together Joshua chapter 1, starting with verse 1. Joshua 1, verse 1 says, Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, "Now, some people say who's the only person in the Bible, the only two people in the Bible who didn't have par who didn't have a father, and uh, some people say Adam and Joshua because he was the son of Nun. That's not what it's talking about. So that's his father's name. But verse two, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give them." even to the children of Israel, every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea, toward the going down of the sun, shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life, as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee, and, and I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of a good courage. Unto this people shall thou divide for an inheritance the land, which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law, which Moses my servant commanded thee, Turn not from it to the right hand, nor to the left, uh, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have I not commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for this chapter, uh, this first chapter of Joshua. I pray that it can be uh, an equipping for us as we, your children, try to live our lives in this generation that you've placed us in. Father, help us to realize that you are doing a work even today. And Father, we pray that you will encourage us to not uh, let others, let, let life pass us by and let others uh, take all the uh, burdens of your work. Father, may, may we say, is there not a cross for me to bear? And is there not a, 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 a victory for me to win? Father, we thank you so much for this, uh, this uh, challenge of Scripture this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now Joshua 
was, a, was one of the most interesting characters in the Bible, I think. Natalie and I loved the name so much that we said, if we ever have children, we'd love to name them Joshua. Uh, I had Cornelius in mind as well, but, but we settled on Joshua, if we ever do have children. But anyway, uh, I thank the Lord for the, the testimony that he had. He was a man who truly did make a difference. And when I preach, I, I kind of like to have a series of uh, messages sometimes. And I preached a message recently about uh, having compassion from the book of Jude and making a difference. And then uh, the next week, we looked, uh, we looked at, at the life of Nehemiah and how he made a difference in his generation. And how we said, some people, lots of people see problems. That's very common, but it's very rare to find people who want to do something about it. And uh, that was the kind of man Nehemiah was. And we saw the place that Scripture had in Nehemiah's life. And then last week, we, back, we backed up in time uh, quite a bit. To, and we looked at the, the king, the young king Josiah, and how he was a man who made a difference in his generation. And how, again, how the Scriptures were central in him making a difference in his generation. And we looked at how, uh, if, how it wasn't... They didn't find uh, the strength to do that in themselves. Uh, Nehemiah had, was sad. He was discouraged. He didn't find the strength in his circumstances or the people around him. Uh, of course, uh, Nehemiah's circumstances were terrible. Josiah's circumstances were terrible. His father was evil, and he died in his sin and went to hell. His father and his, his grandfather Manasseh as well was, he was an evil, wicked king uh, for, for, until the very end. And so, uh, so he had to uh, find it somewhere else, and he found that strength in the scriptures, which his mother, uh, which his mother had sh had shared with him, and which he then found when they found the book of the law in the temple. And so, here's another man, though, who made a real difference in his generation. All the rest of the children of Israel, they didn't want to go into the land. The majority said, "No, we don't want to go into the land. There's giants in that land. We are grasshoppers in their sight." in the book of uh, Numbers where they went to Kadesh Barnea chapter 15 and so so we, we know that uh, Joshua and Caleb they were in the minority they were al alone they were the two good spies ten were bad and two were good and so uh, uh, he, they, were, they were the minority and yet they were able to make a difference because they were strong in what? strong in the strength of the Lord. Remember, Nehemiah said, the joy of the Lord is our strength. Uh, Josiah, he was strong in the Lord. He turned not to the right hand or to the left. The, the Bible told us Josiah did that. And here's Joshua being told, you don't need to turn from the right to the right hand or to the left. Follow the scriptures, and then you can have good success. Good success. So the, the way that Joshua made a difference in, this, in the world that he lived in was, was, was focused on the Word of God. And so uh, if we're going to make a difference in our generation, and we need to, it needs to be th through the Word of God. And so, first of all, I just want to look at a few things about the, this man, Joshua. First, I want to say that uh, Joshua was a changed man. Joshua was a changed man. Now, Joshua was not his name when he was born. Uh, Joshua was the firstborn in his family. And uh, the firstborn, they were always separated unto the Lord. Uh, in, in the children of Israel, the firstborn was separated, and so he was the firstborn. But uh, he was um, hit, named Hoshea, H-O-S-H-E-A. And we found, find that in 1 Chronicles chapter 7. He was named Hoshea, but his name was changed to Joshua. And Joshua means the captain of our salvation. And so God had a plan for Joshua's life. He was changed. And uh, he was also covered. Uh, do you remember? He, was a, he used to be a slave, by the way. He was a slave in Egypt. He, he worked hard as a slave for the first however many years of his life there in Egypt before Moses came. And uh, similarly, uh, in, in the slave market of sin, we were slaves. We were slaves to the devil. And then, of course, just like the Passover lamb came over, uh, the, the Lord Jesus came to us. And uh, he, he's our Passover lamb. And Joshua, he was changed. His name was changed to, from Hosea to Joshua. He was covered. 
He was covered by the blood. Remember, I said he was the firstborn in his family, the Bible tells us. And uh, as the firstborn, he would have been the one that would have died it, uh, when the Passover lamb came over. But the Lord told them, put the blood over the doorpost and the lentils, and then I will pass over you. And if the blood's been applied to your life, then when the judgment comes, it will pass over you. That death angel that is a symbol of the judgment of God, and it will pass over you. And uh, I, lo I love that song uh, in, the, in the hymn books um, that talks about the blood. Uh, is the, uh, I can't remember the name of that song, but uh, uh, Rosalind can tell me what it is. Maybe we can sing it next time. Then I'll pass over you in the chorus. But, but uh, I, I remember hearing stories. Uh, I remember reading Little House on the Prairie, actually, when I was uh, 10 years old. And Laura Ingalls wrote those true stories about her family's adventures and going out west. And one day there was a terrible prairie fire coming towards their, uh, towards their covered wagon as they were, co as they were uh, living in the covered wagon while Pa tried to build the log cabin. The prairie fire was coming, and they thought, oh no, all of our things are going to be destroyed. And then Pa went out with, a, with another fire, and he set fire to all. Uh, he put a ring of fire around their whole camp. And then, of course, where the, where the grass had already been burned, the, the prairie fire just went right past them, and it didn't. They were protected there in the middle of that fire. And you know what? That's the same with us. You know, when, when uh, the, the judgment of God will not come upon us because Jesus has already taken our punishment. The fire has already fallen on Him. And, of course, if we put our faith in Him, then we're covered by His blood. We're protected. The fire has already fallen. The judgment's already come. And that's the, that was the case with Joshua. He was covered by the blood there. And then... He was called. He was, he was changed from a, from a slave, and now he's a servant of God. He's no longer a slave of sin. He's a servant of God. He was uh, covered, and then he was called. And, uh, and, and at the very beginning, he, he had uh, a call upon his life. He was a leader, and he wanted to serve the Lord only. I remember uh, I told you this story many times about Lee Robertson. You all need to be saved. Then you need to surrender your life to the Lord, and then you need to serve the Lord. And then I, that's when I was, felt like the Lord was calling me when I was 12 years old to serve Him. And so there at Camp Joy, I said, Lord, I surrender my life to you, to you. Whatever you want me to do, I'll do it. I'll serve you the rest of my life. And so that's when I believe the Lord was calling me into the ministry to serve Him. And able to start preaching the Word of God and, and serving Him. But... Joshua similarly had a call upon his life. God was preparing him. And when, when Moses went up onto the mountain, uh, uh, by the way, uh, he, was, he was at least uh, two things. He was a soldier. God had prepared him as a soldier for this time of battle. And as a soldier, he had uh, fought against the Amalekites already and the Ammonites. And he had, he had uh, seen God's strength there when the sun stood still. Uh, that's already happened before we get to the uh, book of Joshua, and he had seen the miracle that there as Moses lifted up his hands. And God had also, so God had prepared him for the battle, but God had also prepared him to be the leader. And uh, the Bible says there in verse 1, Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, So, uh, Joshua was not only a soldier, but he was a servant. Uh, we see the, the phrase Moses minister three times in the Word of God. And he's called Moses servant two times in the Word of God. So it pretty much means the same thing. He was a servant. And uh, so God had prepared him as a servant. Uh, I remember when, uh, when I was reading uh, the book of Exodus, chapter uh, just after chapter 20, Moses had been up on the mountain uh, getting the Ten Commandments, and, Mos and Joshua was right there with him. And as they came back down front to the camp, Joshua said, it sounds like the noise of battle. Uh, he, knew, he knew what the noise of, that, that's all that he thought it could have been, was the noise of battle, but it was the children of Israel worshiping that golden calf. But, but when Moses was up on the mountain, Joshua was right there with him. He was with the Lord. He, had, he was able to experience some of that 
uh, closeness to God. And, and in Deuteronomy, cha the last chapter of Deuteronomy, Moses, uh, Joshua was right there, and he had got, gotten this call to be the new uh, leader. And uh, the Bible tell, tells us that uh, uh, God spoke to Moses as a friend speaks to his friend, and now he's speaking. Uh, Joshua's seeing all this. He's seeing uh, God speak as a friend as a friend speaks to a friend. How intimidating that must have been, and yet now it's time for him uh, to step up as the servant. Uh, in the New Testament, we see the word bond slave. The word bond slave. Paul said in Philippians and many other places. Philippians chapter one, he says. Uh, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of the Lord. He was a, or that, that word means bond slave, the bond slave of the Lord. And that's what we are. That's what Joshua was. He used to be a servant of sin, but now he's a, uh, a willing servant of the Lord. In the book of Exodus, it tells us that, uh, that a servant, if he wants to be uh, a, he, at a certain year, the year of Jubilee, servants can be set free if, if they paid their debts. Uh, but if the servant says, no, I love my master, and I will not go, then the, uh, he can become a bond slave. And, uh, and that's a loving servitude. And they would take him and put him against the door of the house and bore a hole through his ear, and he would become a bond slave. And that's what we are. We're bond slaves of the Lord. We love our master. We want to serve him. And servants, we had a, a lady with us this morning, Angela. She is uh, she works in the house of the Namibian ambassador. You know that's a pretty cool job. But but uh, you know if, if you're serving someone important, then it's kind of has some uh, uh, dignity to it, doesn't it? And so, but we serve the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's who we're servants of. And what a wonderful thing it is to be one of God's servants. So Joshua was a soldier of the Lord. He was a servant of the Lord, and here in this chapter, he, he gets his commission. We've seen his change, his, the covering, the calling that he had, and now here is the commissioning of this man, Joshua. And at, in the commissioning, God gives him certain promises, three promises that I wanted to look at together. Uh, remember that uh, this is different challenges that he's about to face, He's about to try to lead about three million people. And so what an amazing responsibility this is. There's different challenges that Joshua's going to face, but it's the same charge that he's being given here. He's given the same charge, but he's also given the same presence, the same promise of God's presence. He says, as I was with Moses, so shall I be with thee, in verse 5. Uh, there shall not be any man that shall be able to stand thee before thee all the days of thy life, as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. So we get uh, the promise of God's presence, and uh, the, the courage should remain. So we get, he gets promise, uh, these, these next three promises, he gets the promise of God's strength, first of all. The promise of God's strength. And what a task, what a task it must have uh, seemed to Joshua. Just imagine Joshua as he's about to stand with this great army that had been cowards in the past. He's seen all their murmurings. He's seen all of their uh, uh, rebelliousness through the 40 years. He was there at Cadiz Bernia when they all wanted to stone him. When he said, no, God, we're well able to take the land. They all wanted to stone Joshua and Caleb. And yet he's, he's standing up saying, uh, he stood up that day saying, we're well able. He's seen all these uh, cowardly people, and now he's supposed to lead them into battle. And you can just imagine, we, we just celebrated or commemorated uh, the 70th anniversary of D-Day. And uh, just think of, that was the, they say that was the, the, the largest invasion in human history. How many uh, thousands of people, but, but maybe this was an even bigger one. Three million people crossing over this river, uh, going into the, the land of Canaan. And so what, a, what an amazing task. Just think of the disciples when Jesus told them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. What a, what a, the, us fishermen, us people who've just denied you, who've just deserted you, uh, who used to be cowards, and yet now you're giving us this great task, this great commissioning. And then he gave them, just as he gave a commission to Joshua, Jesus gave them the great commission. Go ye into all the world 
preach the gospel to every creature, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. What a, what a commission God's given us. But we feel intimidated by it as well. But God's given us the same, the same promise that He gave to Joshua. The promise of His presence. Jesus said, uh, He said, As the Father sent Me, even so send I you. And He said, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And so Jesus is with us. He said, As, as I was with Moses, so shall I be with thee. And He also gives them, as I said, He gives them the promise of strength. Verse number 7 says, Only be thou strong and very courageous. He says that uh, and also in verse 9, Have I not commanded thee, Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee. Again, the promise of His presence. So, the strength comes from the presence of the Lord. Uh, just like it was in Nehemiah, the joy of the Lord being with us, the joy of Him, the joy of the Lord is our strength. And the strength here comes from the facts. He says, be strong, set a semicolon. Then he says, for the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. That's where the strength comes from, the knowledge of his presence. And as we go day by day, it's an impossible task, mission impossible, to see the whole world come to the Lord. Or to even sometimes it seems mission impossible just to see your own loved ones come to the Lord. Or, or to be able to pass out a tract. I remember Natalie said, that Mr. Pavitt gave her a tract once when she was a teenager, a new Christian, and she said uh, they were in Asda for some reason getting something together, and she said that uh, Natalie recognized somebody at the till that she used to go to school with, and Mr. Pavitt took a tract out of his pocket and said, here, give this to your friend. And uh, she said she was the first tract she'd ever given out. She was so nervous, and she said, uh, this is from my pastor. And uh, she was very, but, but uh, you know, the. The, the Lord gives us the strength. And then, but then she, when she got a taste for that, she didn't want to stop. And so the Lord gives us that strength and that courage to be able to, to do His work. So God gives them the promise of strength. He also gives them the promise of His Scriptures. Of the Scriptures. And this has been a, a common theme throughout this study. The, the verse, verse number 7 says, Only be thou strong. The strength comes from His presence. presence it also comes from the Scriptures. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law, which Moses, my servant, commanded thee. Turn not from it, from the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein, for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. So, so at the heart of this commissioning, right before they're going in, he's reminding them that they have the Scriptures. They have the Word of God. These first five books of Moses, they have. They, they, were, they were told uh, that as soon as they get it, that after they get into the land, they're supposed to go back to the same two mountains that they were at before, Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal. Ebal. The mountain of blessing and cursing. Thank you, Brother brother Myers. I appreciate that. And, and he says uh, that happened in chapter 8 of Joshua. They went back to those, uh, I believe it was chapter 8. And uh, they went back to those two places and they put the scriptures there on, the, on those monuments so that they would never forget the scriptures that God had given them. And so God's given us His, His Word. It's a rock. Just as Brother Rob gave the illustration this morning, that uh, it's the lighthouse. It tells you where to go. It doesn't move. And those mountains were mountains that wherever they were at, they would be able to look and see these mountains and remember God's Word is there. That's what we're supposed to follow after. We're not to turn from the right hand or the left of it from His Word. And so they're supposed to, number one, meditate on God's Word. Number two, they're supposed to observe to do according to what's written therein. So, meditate on it, memorize it, uh, chew on it, make it part of your life. Meditating is, it has to do with the idea of, uh, of chewing and mulling it over. I know it's not a very uh, pleasant illustration, but they say that cows have, uh, how many stomachs do cows have? Seven? Seven stomachs? Four stomachs. I got a little ahead of myself. <laughs> they have four stomachs. 
that would be strange to have seven stomachs, I guess, but they have, strange to have four, but they have four stomachs, and they chew it, they swallow it, then they bring it back up and chew it some more and swallow it again, and that's what they do. They're, they're mulling over this cud, and that's what we're supposed to do with scriptures, bring it back up to our mind, meditate on it, make it part of our life, and that's what we need to do with the scriptures. Um, I, I remember Natalie read a book called, um, uh, it's, it's written by Darlene Diebler Rose. It's, she was a great missionary. Uh, it's a famous missionary book. Evidence Not Seen is the name of the book. And uh, in that book, uh, Darlene Diebler Rose and her husband, they went to the Dutch West Indies, which is now Indonesia, as missionaries. And uh, just as they were getting started, 27 years old, the, the World War II started. And the Japanese came in, they took him to one prison camp and her to another, and she never saw her husband again, the 27 years old, and they put her into a ter uh, terrible, through terrible conditions in the six by six cell, eventually is where she ended up. And um, she said there were lice and bugs, and but if she tried to kill the bugs, they would beat her. And uh, so all sorts of things that were happening for, for, for several years, she was, he, she was locked away and she was finally given the order of execution. She, they, they were going to execute her. And so every day she had to wait for that execution that was going to come. And, uh, but she said, throughout it all, I had the strangest peace and joy in the world. And that came from God's Word. She said, as a child, I had had an un, uh, an, an, a, a strain, almost a strange, keen interest in memorizing scriptures when I was a child. And she said, I'm so glad because those same scriptures, God would bring those scriptures to my mind when I needed them. And those were my strength. And those scriptures, those were my joy, she said, at that time in the prison cell. And of course, she later um, was, the, the war ended and she was able to write this wonderful book. But, but you know what? The scriptures, that's, that's our strength as well. And we need those scriptures uh, when, we're, when we're going through life. He says we need to meditate on it. We need to make it part of our life, part of our daily life. And then we need to do it. We need to put it into practice. These the Proverbs and the Word of God are so amazing and practical, but we need to actually take the Proverbs that Solomon wrote and put them into practice. And there's such wisdom there, but we need to use those. Uh, they're, they're there for our use, and that these scriptures were there for Joshua's use and for Joshua's success. So there was, he promised them strength, he promised them his scriptures, his word, his presence was going to be with them, his joy was going to be with them, and then the third promise, he promises, uh, uh, just, just one more illustration about God's word, and him being a servant, him actually putting into practice. Uh, they say that uh, the man who started the American Missionary Society, he pastored uh, Metropolitan Tabernacle for a little while. I can't remember his name at the minute, but uh, he started the American Missionary Society and he made a, um, a, a little a seal or a, a picture a, a, for, for the American Missionary Society. And on it was an ox and a, uh, a plow, an ox and a plow. And underneath it were the words, ready for either sacrifice or service. Ready for either sacrifice or service. And underneath those, that, those words were the letters RFA. And does anybody know what those letters RFA stand for? Uh, well, I think Mr. Pavitt knows what they stand for because it's one of his favorite sayings. Ready for anything. That's what they, they were, ready for anything. Rather for, ready for sacrifice or for service. And, and Joshua was a servant of the Lord who was ready for anything. He was ready to, waiting for the command of the Lord and ready to do it, ready to follow God's word. We need to be ready for anything. We need to list, be listening to God as we read his word, be ready to obey it, come to church, ready to hear God's word preached. And if God speaks to your heart, ready to obey it, ready to do it. And then when, if, you're, if you're doing that, then when you're out in the world then you will be ready for anything. If you've got the Word of God in your heart, 
If you've got, if you've been meditating on it, if you've been memorizing it, then you'll be equipped. And my dad read the verse from 1 Timothy uh, at our Friday fellowship on uh, this past Friday night, and he, he pointed out how how uh, much better it is in the King James version than all the other versions because it has the word study. And that's what we need to do. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And he said, uh, my dad said, why, why is the word ashamed there? He said, because when you're out in the world and somebody asks you a question about the Bible, if you don't know the answers, then you'll be ashamed and you'll, you won't know... Uh, you won't know how to help people, and you won't be ready for anything. But we need to have God's Word with us. Uh, we have the promise of His strength, His presence being with us, the promise of His Scriptures, His Word, and His equipping being with us. And then the third promise that I was uh, going to get to is the promise of success. So, strength, Scripture, and success. Look at the end of verse 8 again. For then, after you've meditated on God's Word and put it into practice, then... Thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Now, I've heard lots of messages from Joshua chapter 1, and most people just jump straight to this, this, uh, this last part of verse 8, and they say, see, there's how you can have prosperity and success. And that's the goal, is to have success. But we should never make uh, a byproduct the goal. And so many people... Now, by the way, this is the only episode of the word success found in the Bible. And that's, that is important. But uh, the success comes as a byproduct of serving God, of, of looking at His Word. The goal is God. The goal is the Lord and serving Him. And then success is the byproduct of that. And so, so many people are looking for success. You, you see that word prosperity twice given to us here. Then thou shalt make thy way prosperous. Verse 7, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou, thou goest. And we, we have lots of people who, who run with that word prosper. We have people who preach prosper, the prosperity gospel. People like Joel Olstein who, who say, God wants, you, God wants you to have your best life now. That's the title of his best-selling book. He pastors the largest church in America, Lakewood Church in Texas. And, uh, of course, I, do, I disagree with the name of that book. We don't have our best life now unless you're unsaved and going to hell. And, uh, but uh, he says uh, uh, the prosperity God wants to give you, he wants to give you a promotion, he wants to give you. And, and if, you, if you give me so much money, I'll give you a handkerchief that you can, that you can uh, be blessed with. You can make millions and... Uh, of course, I do believe that God does bless. God does bless us as we obey His word. That's what this verse tells us. But that's not the goal. And of course, Joel Osteen says, uh, if if you uh, if you live your best life now, if you, and of course, he never talks about sin. That's his main problem. But he says, uh, then God will make your whole life prosperous. And he said, you'll be driving to the supermarket, and God will open up the 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 uh, parking space right at the very front and you can park right in that parking space but my question is what about the little old lady that you cut off as you tried to get into that parking space <laughs> but, uh, but anyway that's not the goal the goal is is God but he does tell us that as we're serving him the byproduct there is is the pros is the prosperous success of the Christian life and uh, the, the prosperity here is uh, is something is 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 being in the will of God. That's the most prosperous life. That's the most successful life. People ask, what is success anyway? And they, they wrote that in a newspaper once. And uh, they said, what is success? What's the best definition of success that you can give us? And there was a little old lady who wrote in. She got the award. Uh, the best, the best um, definition of success. And it was uh, love much, laugh often, and... I can't remember what the third one was. But uh, love much, laugh often, and live long. Live yeah, that's, well, that's right. Live long, love much, and laugh often was the, was the definition of success. But if that was the definition of, of success, there's lots of people in the Bible who weren't successful. Jesus didn't live very long. He didn't laugh. There's no record, record in the Bible of him laughing very much. And uh, there's lots of people in the Bible who, who that, that doesn't count. And so, but what is the Bible's definition of success? The Bible's definition of success 
is, li is not turning away from his word and doing what he's given you to do and being obedient, an obedient servant. That's the definition the Bible gives for success. And according to that, uh, John the Baptist, Jesus said he was the, the, there's no greater man under that's ever been born than John the Baptist. And of course, he didn't live long, but uh, he was successful. Joshua was successful. Nehemiah was successful. Josiah was successful because they were obedient to God's word. They were in God's will. And they lived the life that God wanted them to live. Uh, so many people succeed at, at things that are not God's will. The greatest failure in your life could be that you succeed at something that's not God's will. That would be a failure. Succeeding at, at things that are not God's will. And so we need to ask God to give us true success by living our lives obedient to Him as His servants. And then we can have the promise of His strength, of the Scriptures, and of success. And we can live that life in uh, in. Canaan land, the, the land that we, we looked at the book of Hebrews a few weeks ago about how Canaan land is a picture of the, of the victorious Christian life. Sometimes in the book of Hebrews it switches back and forth. Canaan land is a picture of heaven, but it's, a, but, uh, and, but it's also a picture in the book of Hebrews of the spirit-filled life, depending upon the Lord. And it's a place, that's a, the spirit-filled life is a place of true success. Uh, we have success in heavenly places. In heaven, you'll have success at everything. Because, you know, you'll, you'll plant something and it will grow. No problem, no thorns. And you'll do work and there'll be, it'll, never, it'll, never get, uh, it'll never get rusty or tarnished. It'll be truly successful. Uh, but, you know, we can have success here on this earth by living that victorious, spirit-filled Christian life having success in heavenly places. And the, uh, the quote that Brother Rob preached when he preached this morning, the quote that, that, that I loved the most was uh, the one from Jonathan Edwards. Only one life to live will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. That's true success. That's what's going to last. And so may we all ask the Lord to uh, give us the right attitude uh, about what's truly uh, the priority, what's true, what's true success, what's true prosperity, as we look to His Word. Now, as I said before, we can make a difference in this world. You and I can make a difference in our communities, in our families, in our workplaces, uh, but our attitude towards the Word of God will determine the success that you have towards those things. Our, the attitude that our church has toward the Word of God will determine what God does with this church. And it really will. So many churches have the wrong attitude towards God's Word. But I'm thankful that we have a church. Fiona, Rudy's wife, wrote a status on Facebook. And she quoted Joshua 1.8 in her status about a week and a half ago. And she said on her status, she said, I'm so glad that I have a church that emphasizes God's Word. And I am too, aren't you? And we emphasize the right things. And uh, that, as we obey it, though, as we meditate on God's Word, then we'll see true success. We'll be able to move forward just as Joshua did. He was able to move forward and win all the victories that the entire past generation had failed to win. Here in England, there's been a lot of, a lot of churches closing, a lot of churches that have compromised according to God's Word and have closed. And uh, ever since World War II, the preachers went to Germany, they went to liberal Bible colleges in Germany. Uh, not, nothing wrong with Germany, but uh, Ulrika, but, uh, but these liberal Bible colleges in Germany, they were coming back to England and preaching. The book of Genesis didn't really happen. Uh, the miracles didn't really happen. And then the soldiers came back from World War II. They heard the preachers preaching like that, and they said, the preachers don't even believe this stuff anymore. And so they stopped leaving their families to go. But uh, Joshua, he was not like that. He said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, and we will stay true to the Scriptures. That's, that's true success. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your Word and the strength that it gives us. We also thank you, Father, for your presence. We ask that you'll go with us this week. Uh, Father, I pray that if there's anyone here who's living for the wrong things, that you'll convict them of that and, and reveal that to them. Show them and help them to get on the path 
of your word, of the scriptures, and live their life according to your will, and not to turn in their day-to-day -day life to the right hand or to the left. Help me, Father, not to turn aside. Give me the strength from your presence and from your scriptures that I need to do that. And, Father, we pray, we pray for the success, but most of all, Father, we pray that we'll be good servants of you, pleasing to you in all that we do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.